House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we we're jumping into this a few minutes late uh, because floor went a bit longer than we had anticipated this morning. Um, and we have a couple of uh, witnesses with us this morning who have tight time constraints. And so I'd, what I'd like to do is uh, welcome them to share their thoughts on um, S-124 um, first, and then we'll go through some of the other folks who've got a little more time. Uh, just for context here, um, S-124 contains uh, a number of uh, provisions that are related to dispatch um, and EMS services. And so that's kind of the areas of the bill that we're going to focus on here. But of course, if um, witnesses have other thoughts that they'd like to share with us, we'd welcome them too. So I'm going to start with Dan Batsy, the uh, EMS uh, director or chief at the Department of Health, if you would share your thoughts with us. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I've had, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've had very little time to review the S-124. Um, so I don't have a deep uh, 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 testimony to offer you here today. Um, I've only done a, a very cursory review of it and I apologize that it was sort of handed to me last minute. Um, uh, however, I don't see any major uh, concerns from my desk anyway. Um, I, I, I think probably my best role today here would be to answer any questions you might have or to respond to the concerns that you're bringing to the table. All right, committee, any questions from the Department of Health standpoint? Um, it doesn't give us a lot of uh, context to jump into here in terms of asking questions. Um, so if you're able to hang around with us for a few more minutes, um, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so I understand that uh, Chief Morano of Wilmington only has a, a, a bit more time um, to be with us this morning. So Chief, um, if you could unmute yourself and, and share with us the thoughts that you have on the bill. Well, thanks for, for hearing me today. Um, our, you know, we have, we have a little list of concerns about the dispatch component of this bill um, and the invoicing of dispatch services to local communities from the state. Um, we, have, we have a couple concerns about the bill right out of the gate. Um, we, we in Wilmington have our own um, dispatch. So we dispatch um, about half the time here. We do seven days a week, eight to five. Um, and then at night, so to speak, we switch over to state police dispatch. Um, you know, our, our concerns are um, with the two kind of um, notice of intent to invoice that we've got from DPS, they actually charge us for our own work we're doing, meaning the call structure that they're charging us for. Um, currently, the way it's set up, we do about 57% of our own dispatch they cover us about 43% if it's broken down by calls um, that generate incidents. And that's how DPS got that billing arrangement. Um, my understanding is, is that they are gonna take this into account, um, but I notified them of that um, issue back in February, meaning we would actually double pay for work we're already doing here locally. We would also pay DPS for that. Um, the other concern I have is that this was presented to us um, as a way to fairly distribute the cost of state dispatch um, to its users. However, looking through the invoice list, there, there's really a large number of municipalities that will not be invoiced. And it's interesting to note the ones that will be invoiced are mostly um, towns that have their own police departments. So the towns that are locally funding police departments, which reduces the burden on the state police and the state budget, um, are getting hit now with invoices for having police departments. Um, now I can speak kind of to Wilmington quickly. We're, we're kind of in the middle of a rural area of Wilmington. I think out of the six or seven surrounding towns, only one other town has a police department down here. Um, and none of those towns I noticed were being invoiced for their calls or 
the dispatch services that the state will provide them. Um, and, that, and that is information that's readily available um, through our computer aided dispatch service um, program that we run, which is called Spillman. A lot of agencies, including DPS are on it. Um, so that information is readily available, but for some reason, um, we're, we're not seeing that. Um, my other concern is- Thank you, Harrison. And we are very limited in police resources in Vermont and everybody shares resources and um, does agency assists and helps each other. One of the things I'll point out is that Wilmington PD kind of situated, surrounded by rural areas, does a lot of agency assist calls to the state. Um, you know, on major events, we move to these calls to um, cover those calls until the state can get there on scene because we're, we're a little bit shorter response time. So my concern is that we're gonna get for a tit for tat kind of situation where do we start billing the state for those calls? The other, the other thing I point out is that Wilmington has large sections of two state highways, Route 9 and 100, Route 9 being the main east-west corridor through Southern Vermont. And we cover a lot of collisions and issues on these state highways. Um, is, is that something, and this has already been brought to my attention locally, is, is that something that, that as part of this bill, we will start to invoice DPS for, um, for maintaining those roads, keeping them open, handling the collisions on it, and those sort of things. Um, so I, I really hate the idea that we're gonna get into this kind of realm of how we can all invoice everybody else in public safety to try and recoup our budget. Um, I, you know, we have to be able to work together um, in, in this state. There's just too few resources. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have this data available in front of you, but I, I'm just curious to understand from the perspective of a small rural police department, what kind of budget impact are you looking at um, relative to, uh, to what you're currently spending on your eight to five dispatch? Um, so it, it's a graduated invoicing system they have set up. I think it, it for Wilmington, it ends around maybe 74,000 per year. Um, but I can tell you that that will be a significant impact to our overall budget. I, I would um, estimate that somewhere at, off the top of my head, maybe a 15% impact, 12% impact, um, you know, may, maybe substantially more in there um, for, for our overall police budget here. Thank you, John Gannon. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you for testifying, Chief Morano. Um, you, you forwarded to me um, a letter dated August 18th, 2020 from Captain Burnham. Um, and it attached dispatch, a dispatch fee work, worksheet. Um, did those, and so the, the total for Wilmington is I believe 78,000 plus dollars. And um, so that included both uh, calls that, that the Wilmington Police Department dispatched as well as Vermont State Police. Is that correct? That the is. Your yeah. And, and you've raised these concerns with the Vermont State Police that the numbers are inaccurate or include Wilmington Police Department dispatches. I have um, as early as in February of this year and more recently with Captain Burnham from the state police. Um, and that, you know, I, I've been advised that they're gonna look at it um, and, and try and make that more fair and equitable. But, that, but that's only one portion of the concerns here. Yep. And, and Chief, if, if you know, if, if you were to be charged the 78 plus thousand dollars a year um, when the, the full fee is starting to be charged to, to Wilmington. You know, how will that impact how the Wilmington Police Department will be able to provide services, if you know? Uh, well, we, I mean, there's already been some suggestions about how we are going to try and come up with that money in our budget. Um, you know, what, what 
corners we could cut locally. Um, but one of the suggestions would be that we end our on-call time, meaning um, when the officer goes in at night, Wilmington PD is a 24-hour agency, so they call us out to come back for complaints. Um, but you know, one of the, one, but again, if we do that, then it just pushes that burden back to the state police to respond to those calls, and pushes a larger portion of that um, onto their budget. So, you know, it's it's kind of a tit for tat here, and I and I, you know, there's no no easy way for us to come up with seventy eight thousand dollars per year in our budget. Um, it just isn't there. So um, one last question, just so the rest of the committee knows. Um, there used to be a Vermont State Police barracks in West Brattleboro, um, and now it's in Westminster. How far is that from Wilmington? And how long does it take um, a call to be answered by the state police? It's, it's about a half hour to 45 minutes, depending on traffic and weather condition. Thank you. Committee, any other questions? All right, um, Chief Humphreys, are you um, are you prepared to, to speak about the uh, the dispatch fees so that we can stay on topic, or should we come back to you at a different time? Um, I can speak, or I can take questions. However, you want to do it. Well, I would love to hear what your um, what the impact will be to uh, to your budget and uh, and how you're currently uh, achieving dispatch in Fairhaven? Um, we we currently used uh, VSP out of Westminster. Prior to the consolidation, it was out of Rutland. Um, I guess I'll start out with a direct quote from my select board as of yesterday. If we have to pay that, he will no longer support a local police department. He advised he wanted the local police, but at the fee that's being proposed to us, um, they would have to rethink that. The fee that we got quoted was $112,000. My total operating budget is right around 325 to 350, so that would be one third of my total budget. Um, in that fee, it appears I, I've talked to Captain Burnham and the commissioner at length. In that fee, it also includes our um, cases that we start our own in our office. We, we've pushed over the last 16 years that I've been chief to document more and more um, to try to keep our data on in check. And, and so I've actually even had the animal control officer now using our Spillman system to document loose dogs. Um, so if it resulted in a hearing in front of the um, select board, we would be better prepared. Um, we do fingerprinting services where we charge $18 a finger for employment. I have my clerk now enter them into the a CAD system to keep track of everybody we fingerprinted. We also do overweight permits for our town and I've had my clerk enter those at better tracking every year if we look at one's been issued or not issued. So based on the number they gave us, we had 2,115 calls times 53 was $112,000. We're a four-man police department. Um, it literally will either push the to out of business or to a two-man police department. I could see where we cover 16 hours a day, five days a week versus 20 hours a day, seven days a week. As of Wilmington, we also do on-call. Um, our town is looking at a $6 million sewer bond. As you know, each $10,000 you add is a 1% tax increase. I, I see our budgets getting voted down. Our school budget went down this year. And ultimately, I, how can I argue with the select board if they say we're going to cut staff? Uh, I've gone back and forth as, as simple as this morning. I sent Captain Burnham an email. We had a 911 hang up at the, at the grade school. Ended up being a medical call, not a police call. Under the scenario they're given, so fire or for EMS and police got a case started. Is that $106 um, for the day? Um, in our case numbers, we do crosswalk. Um, we list them as directed patrols twice a day. So again, is that $106 a day for us to do crosswalk to make sure our students get to school safely? Um, it, it seems kind of absorbent to go um, by calls. I think there should be a better formula that needs, needs to be looked at. Um, call volumes is arbitrary. Um, we have cases where the dispatcher arbitrarily enters a case for our zone. It might be Castleton. 
um, to echo Wilmington, and I said this to the commissioner, was we go to Benson to back up a trooper and they start agency assist case. So now we're being charged $53 to go out of town and help you. Not that we mind. I mean, we have a great working relationship with the state police and we will go anywhere in the state to help them. But it does come down to tit for tat. Do we charge a minimum of four hours at 67.50 an hour for going out of town, our contract rate for other towns when we do law enforcement. Um, and again, we don't wanna get into tit for tat, but I just, from my standpoint, our department being as small as we are, will be done. I mean, we won't be able to do what we do. And again, I've pushed for debt better reporting. We've pushed to take as much responsibility as possible off the state police um, to cover. My thoughts and my select board thoughts is we already pay taxes for that dispatch center. And then we created a police department to address our own problems instead of relying on somebody else. And I guess that's where we think it's unfair that Benson and West Haven and other towns outside pay that same tax rate but they don't have a police department. Um, this has been going on and on. I mean, Benson trained a constable. We trained them, we put them through an FDO program. The first time they used the radio, that constable got a call from the state police said you can't use our radio system. But they want better policing and they want to handle their own problems. And this was for probably five or six years ago. But again, Benson pays for that dispatch center, but then when they trained a constable, they couldn't use them. Um, it seems like it's top dollar. Um, I know when I talked to the commissioner, he said that 43% of the time was under municipal time. So my thought would be if we have to pay, would there be a reduction in staff? If we all left and went to another agency for dispatch servicing, would you cut your services by 43%? I don't think that will happen. Um, our, our rescue squad currently is, is barely hanging on. They, they bill Medicaid 100 or approximately $240. Now, Every time they go to the call, they're gonna to have to give their dispatch center $53 of that. Our rescue squad is teetering on the edge of being done. And this is just a, cur uh, just a further tax or a further burden on our communities. Committee, do you have any questions for the Fairhaven Police Chief? Marsha Gardner. You're, uh, you're muted at the moment. Let's see if we can get you unmuted. Okay. Oh, I hear you. Okay. Sorry to jump on late. Uh, thank you to the two uh, chiefs that we just heard from. Um, Richmond is in a very similar situation. We have our own police department. We have been told that we will be charged over $50 per call for dispatch. And our police force spends a significant amount of time up on I-89 dealing with issues there for um, no compensation. And I know we have a great relationship with the state police, but at the same time, it seems like we're being charged for, for one thing and we're offering assistance where we are not receiving any kind of comp compensation. Thank you. Jim Harrison. Uh yeah, thank you, uh, Chief Humphreys. I am um, um, concerned about the uh, incentive this might be placing on the town to either reduce your small staff or do without. And if, if the town chose to go that direction, what would happen to um, response time and coverage for incidences that you get called out for now? Any um, idea? I, well, I mean, right now, if we were disbanded today, it would all fall to the state police uh, or the town have to make a decision on who that they would contract with another town, contract with the sheriffs. So I couldn't tell you what the town fathers would do. Ultimately, if you took our 2,115 calls, it would be dumped right now back onto the state. I, I do have one more thing that I forgot to, that I wanted to point out if, if you, if I have a second. Yes, absolutely. Um, when I got the fee structure and I've asked and it's not been clarified, if you look at Brandon Police Department, they're, they're proposed being charged $45,000 um, a year versus our 112. They have eight full-time officers. And I just can't see where, where the, the difference is that we're that much busier than Brandon, which has a larger population and more staff. 
Um, the only difference I can find is they're using the Valcor reporting system and we have stayed with the state police to mirror them for better information sharing, we believe was, would be the Spillman reporting system. Um, and mostly all the Valcor numbers are entered by their own officers. So I don't know if there's a disparity between Valcor and Spillman. Um, no, I, I haven't really gotten that answer. I don't know if Captain Burnham could answer that or not, or Commissioner. So Chief, maybe a, a related but unrelated question. Um, obviously one option would be for the town just to increase its budget um, by 115,000 or whatever the number is um, and increase the local tax rate uh, as a consequence. Now, but it seems to me Fairhaven had a little difficulty passing a school budget this year. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if townspeople in the area feel like they're at the breaking point with property taxes or would just be considered a different issue. I don't know the ins and outs of what happened with the school board, but I think it took three times maybe. Um, well, some, some of their issue, some of their issue, sir, was the uh, actual school bond they were trying to, the initial vote was a $60 million bond. Um, the second time, I don't believe the bond wasn't in there and it still failed. So I guess I couldn't speak to why, but I, I do think we're at our breaking point. We are one of the poorest communities um, in, in the county and in the state. Um, I think we have high water bills. We have an aging sewer system. Again, we just took out a $6 million bond to replace our sewer plant. And then we, our water bills have gone up. Um, we're looking at a local option tax of 1% that they're gonna be voting on um, and try to offset the sewer. If that fails, everybody's um, sewer bill will probably go up $60 a quarter. Um, so if you add 112,000 on a $300,000 budget, we're gonna, we're gonna be now pushing into that, you know, where, yeah. 450 range for four for a four man department um, when you could go to the sheriff's and probably contract for three I mean where would you go I mean our department will I, I'm predicting drastic cuts to our department if this was to get to go through okay thank you committee any other questions for either of the chiefs who are with us right now All right, I am going to um, invite um, uh, Lieutenant Burnham to speak next um, and, and lest he should feel like he's um, the skunk who's being invited to the garden party. I, I just want to I just want to acknowledge here for the assembled group that what we have right now um, currently in the way of providing dispatch services around the state is a complicated mosaic. And some communities are, uh, are getting a good deal. Uh, some communities are getting a really sweet deal. Um, and some communities are paying for, um, for their own dispatch services um, because they have recognized that, uh, that that's what they need to do. Um, to meet the needs of their communities. And so I think as we look at the, uh, at the issues around uh, dispatch fees and the the uh, the fairest way to uh, to assess the cost of dispatch, we just need to recognize um, that not only is there a difference between one community and another, but there's a difference um, within communities whether they're paying for some dispatch. You know, maybe they're paying for police dispatch and um, and not paying for fire and EMS or they're paying for it in, with two different entities. Um, and so it's a complicated uh, system right now. And so um, thank you, Lance Burnham, for being with us. And um, please uh, share with us your information. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you, you kind of stole my thunder there. That was a very accurate depiction of really what Vermont is facing with our dispatching service throughout throughout the state. Um, I, I want to recognize that I've heard both uh, chiefs' concerns, um, and I've had conversations with both of them. Um, and we are in the process right now of reviewing all those numbers that both chiefs have um, have expressed. I'm meeting, I'm going to be meeting with hopefully most of these agencies in person to make sure that we have these right numbers. Uh, we, we understand that it's, uh, there may be some discrepancies 
and we're certainly willing to work with those agencies to make to make that right. Um, um, and that that is starting. Um, it, as a matter of fact, I'm meeting with two departments next week. Um, but I think I want to uh, touch on base one thing, as as you said, Madam Chair. The biggest thing. This is not designed uh, of Commissioner Sherling's fee structure is not designed to be a revenue generating portion for the Vermont State Police. This is designed to cover our costs of doing business um, for our agencies to cover dispatching services for these local municipalities, local fire departments, fire and EMS. Um, this, the, the fees that have been um, assessed or will be assessed is strictly to cover the incremental costs of our dispatchers. This does not include supervision. This does not include um, any overhead that the Vermont State Police currently does. And it does not include any administrative tasks that uh, VSP currently provides. So I think that's very important to note. This, this money that we that is being assessed is not necessarily uh, a revenue generating service for the Vermont State Police. And as you noted, um, I live in Lamoille County, uh, just to share some discrepancies as to where we are. I currently live in the town of Cambridge. We have a no law enforcement other than the Vermont State Police. We have a volunteer fire department and we have a volunteer EMS. We are dispatched through the Lamoille County Sheriff's Department. Currently, this, the, our town of Cambridge pays $113,000 to Lamoille County Sheriff's Department for dispatching services for no full-time agencies and only for volunteer agencies. I can look out my, my bedroom window on the, and look over the mountain and my very next town is Underhill. Very comparable to the town of Cambridge when it comes down to the fire calls, EMS calls and stuff like that. But because they are dispatched by us through the Vermont State Police, they receive that dispatching service for free. Now, that is the equity issue that we're trying to solve throughout the entire state. Um, why is it that one town pays nothing, yet the very next town pays $113,000? And as you mentioned, Madam Chair, that, that's a, it's a statewide system. It is out there. Every Lamoille County has a very um, complex way of charging. Barry City has a very uh, minor way of charging. Uh, St. Albans PD, who also dispatches for other agencies, also has a very unique way of charging. Um, so when we have actually started down this process, we wanted to be as transparent and um, equitable as we possibly could. Um, I've been in this position for just about a year now. Uh, this is not new to the Vermont State Police. We have been talking about this for, I believe, almost 12 years. We have been going down this road. Um, and Commissioner Sherling, as you may or may not be aware, has a very robust plan of modernizing the Vermont uh, law enforcement. Um, and this is in line with his uh, fees. Um, the, I don't know if the committee has the fee structure. Does, does everyone have access to that? Uh, and I'm happy to discuss uh, all of that, but it wasn't a, the $53 that we had chosen was just not a number that we just randomly came up with. Um, we came up with how much does it cost to run both of our PSAPs through the Williston and the Westminster barracks. We took the average number of calls for each agency that we did, that we do dispatch for, and that's where that final number came up from. Uh, I do not anticipate that to change. Um, I've heard it a couple times where people are worried that they're going to get charged $53 uh, from here on out. The number that we have projected, and the commissioner obviously has a right to, to change that, um, but that will be the flat fee that will be charged uh, throughout the process. Um, I, I think I'm here more for questions and I'm happy to answer those, um, but it, it, it's a I understand the situation is uh, we are more than willing to, to meet with any agency to make sure that this gets done as smoothly as processed or as smoothly as possible, but also as fair as possible. 
Um, I'm happy to meet with anybody who thinks that their numbers are inaccurate, and we will make sure that they get uh, um, billed accordingly and accurately. Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Lieutenant, for joining us this morning. Um, a couple of uh, quick questions. You mentioned the unfairness when you have neighboring towns that might be similar in some respects and are paying different services for dispatch, uh, whether they're getting it free from state police um, or hiring a regional service to do it, which they might think is, you know, perhaps, I mean, obviously it's a choice they made, so they might think, you know, uh, they're getting more for their money. I don't, I don't really know. Um, I'm wondering, um, with all this duplication that we have going on, um, if we've looked at maybe the state police just doing all this and not have um, these various um, places set up kind of duplicating services in the, especially in the same area. I, I think I understand your question and I don't know if it's my connection or yours. I, I think I only heard a little bit of it, but uh, I think if you ask the Vermont State Police, and please correct me if I'm wrong, are you asking if does it make sense for the Vermont State Police to take over all dispatching? Um, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, I'm, 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 I'm trying to look at how can we do this efficiently? Paying for it's a different question, whether we pay for it with income taxes or, you know, what arguably we're doing now, uh, or whether we do something else. But have we looked at how do we do the service that we all agree needs to be done statewide and efficient as possible? And it sort of begs the question, in your example, you got two neighboring towns using different services. Right. So there, there are communities out there and there are uh, counties that are looking at countywide dispatching services. Uh, I know Chittenden County is uh, aggressively going down that path. Um, the biggest issue that they're running up against is uh, the financial cost of that. Um, that that's going to be a, a tremendous amount of money th just to get that up and running, uh, either through hardware, through computer systems, and through uh, radio communications and things such as that. Um, I like that idea, to be honest with you, because it keeps everything localized and you get people who know the area and are dispatching for that one particular area. Um, but I do feel that that is a, I, to say it's a long-term goal uh, would be, would, would say that it, it's potentially there. I think it's a very long-term goal if it's even doable financially. For the Vermont State Police to take over it, um, we, you would have to increase my staff by three times of what we would have. Currently, we dispatch for 101 agencies. Um, that's fire, EMS, and uh, police. Uh, I have a staff of 88 people, um, and we cannot keep up with what we have right now. And that sounds like a lot, um, but you also have to take into consideration that my two PSAPs also does 911, which... Um, out of my Westminster barracks, I'm probably averaging 200 calls a day. Out of my Williston barracks, I'm probably averaging 200 to 250 calls a day. And that's above and beyond the dispatching services. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I realize that there's not a simple answer. I just, we're 625,000 people. We're a small city and we have, and I, I agree having a local dispatch center certainly has advantages, but at what cost? If we were Greater Albany, we would have one dispatch center. Um, you know, Boston has one, I'm sure. Um, it may be a backup, but um, so I just throw that out there. The other question I have more specifically to S124, 
I'm a little bit confused. You, there's these proposals to implement fees right now to various uh, towns or cities. And then there's a proposal in 124 to initiate something uh, over three years or not begin for three years. So um, do you have existing authority to implement fees now? I mean, usually fees go through the legislature. That's, that's why I ask. Yes, um, uh, Title 20 um, uh, allows for the Commissioner of Public Safety to implement fees uh, for the services that the dispatching uh, provides. I believe it's uh, Title 20, Section 1871. Bob Hooper, are you so waiting you patiently? Oh, sorry, Jim, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. My connection's awful. Um, uh, so, Lieutenant, do you have any reaction to what's in 124 in regards to a three-year delay? I believe the um, I believe the three-year delay um, is in direct line to the um, regionalized dispatching services, not the fee structures that will be coming from the commission. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob Hooper. Again, um, Captain, if, if this fee structure change goes through, do you anticipate adding more positions? Uh, um, I, I would love to. Um, I, I would see that um, I don't believe that's in the cards right now. Uh, we just added four positions last uh, year. Uh, it was very difficult to get those positions. Um, and yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't foresee uh, a need right now for um, more positions. I mean, obviously, I'm, if you want to give them to me, I'll take them. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> so, not, where, not where we're going with this. Right. Uh, so my, no. my thing is, though, is that we, for a very long time, we were running a shortage of dispatchers just through hiring practices. We just, it takes almost... I want to say six to nine months to get a dispatcher up from the time of hire to the time where they are effectively able to dispatch on their own. Um, it takes a very long time. Um, we are now in a position where by the end of this year, we will be very close to full staff and operating much more effectively. Um, so then overtime is not a problem. So the money that is going to come in, you puzzle. I I got confused when you started to say that this was money that was going to come in was not going to basically offset anything. So this is basically just back funneling the department's budget. I don't know where that money will go. That's up to the commissioner, uh, Representative. Um, I don't know if it comes to DPS. I that's above my pay grade. Um, all I know is that the fees that were uh, designed were designed. Uh, based solely on covering the fees of the dispatchers. Um, and that's, again, yeah, that's I, the I, salary. I understand that. And to Jim's point about regional dispatching, your answer to that is exactly the argument that was used to not go to the two central PSAP, uh, that local dispatching was the way to, to serve the communities better because people that were sitting at the microphones knew the environment that they were dispatching to. Thank you, Madam Chair. John Gannon. Um, thank you. Um, first, a question, question for Betsy Ann and then a question for Captain Burnham. Betsy Ann, could you please clarify Section 17 of S-124 as to what it applies to? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. And if members have access to the current S124 annotated strike all, you could see that current language about the authority for DPS to charge rates on page 23. And it is the statute that the captain cited, 20 VSA 1871, in that subsection I, which currently provides that, and I'm quoting, that the commissioner of public safety may enter into contractual arrangements to perform dispatching functions 
for state, municipal, or other emergency services, establishing charges sufficient to recover the costs of dispatching. What S-124 would do is go on to say that the commissioner would be required to adopt rules that set forth the rates for dispatch functions performed under this subsection. Um, so I think the idea was an overall setting of what rates would apply when the commissioner or the, the department charges for dispatch functions that the department performs. And it was that rule regarding the rates that has that three-year rollout. I think if there wanted to be a, if the General Assembly wanted to state explicitly that DPS shall not charge anything for dispatch in for, for three years, I think that language could be strengthened regarding um, the transitional provision that has the three-year rollout, which you can find in that section 17 that you referenced, Representative Gannon, that starts on page 25 of the strike all because um, the rulemaking is rega in regard to the dispatch rates themselves, which I understood to be um, how DPS charges for the dispatch functions that it performs. But I think, so I just think there should be clear, there, there could be clarity in the language about whether there should be a, a complete, um, there should be no charging of dispatch rates for three years. So, Betsy, and just a follow up question Doesn't typically the legislature set fees? It typically does. Um, here was, you can see on that bottom of page 23, those that existing statutory authority to charge for dispatch function it performs. Um, so if you did want to stop that completely from happening until the General Assembly was able to set the own its the rates itself, for example, how DPS would charge, um, you could do that in law. Okay, thank you. Um, now I have a, a couple of questions for Captain Burnham. Um, first of all, um, thank you um, for indicating that you would you know reach out to the various police departments that have concerns um, and, and get back to them. Uh, but I also had a question based on a, a question that Chief raised, which is Brandon's numbers um, odd. And, you know, I'm looking at the chart. I mean, Middlebury has um, 16 um, staff. I, I don't know if they're all law enforcement officers, but 16. Um, they have a very small number of calls based on that 484 and their charge would only be a little over $25,000. Are you guys also gonna look at towns that seem to be outliers with respect to low cost to, to make sure um, that there isn't some discrepancy there? Yeah, so if you look at the, uh, if you're looking at the dispatch worksheet, um, Middlebury also has uh, their dispatchers, they have their own dispatchers. And these are calls that were generated through Spillman alone um, that were generated by our agency. So that's why those numbers are lower. But so Chief if we Carroll has so, already testified that the Wilmington numbers include both Vermont State Police dispatches as well as Wilmington dispatches. I mean, we're a much smaller community it, than I'm sorry, can you can you repeat your question, sir? Sure, it, it, but you know, Chief Morano has already testified that the numbers for Wilmington include both Vermont State Police as well as Wilmington Police Department dispatch. Right, and we can correct that. I I, I plan to meet with uh, uh, Chief about that. We're, we are only the intent here is to charge on the agents on the cases that came through our PSAPs and were started and generated through our PSAP. If, if there was a case that was generated uh, while the chief had staff, um, and I don't wanna speak for the commissioner, but I'm, I'm in line, I believe I'm in line with what his, uh, his thoughts are. If it was generated by their dispatch, we should not be charging for that. I mean, we have two, as I said, this week, I, next week I'm meeting with two agencies just based on that fact alone. Okay, 
And, and do you? I know you've you've sent a letter to to all law, law enforcement agencies around the state. Um, are you going to follow up just to make sure that you've corrected any discrepancies that may exist in the data as you learn more from various uh, uh, people you have one-on-one -on -one meetings with? Yes, absolutely. And uh, and I'm also and as I said, we have we dispatch for 101 agencies. Um, we, if you look at my letter, I've asked the agencies to look at the data, review the data against their own, and if they feel there's a discrepancy, to please reach out to me, and I and I will do that. Um, well, I, I appreciate that, but you, you also note in your letter that some people had already shared concerns, and you didn't get back to them um, because of budgetary constraints and staffing levels. Yeah. So I'm just concerned about whether that's going to become a problem. Um, with respect to this second effort, that was a meeting that was um, that was set up by the agent by myself and Commissioner Sherling to meet with the with the agencies that had issues. The reason that meeting did not have is because of COVID nineteen restrictions. We were not allowed to get together during that time, so we we continued to do this work uh, of reviewing this data. Um, hence, why we sent the letter out. Okay. And, and one final question is, you know, you know, towns that don't have police departments, they're not going to get charged at all. Is that correct? Correct, because they're being charged, they're being covered by the Vermont State Police. Can you explain that? I mean, why wouldn't they be charged? I mean, because we You're can't, we would, we would be charging our own agency. We, the towns that come, that do not have their own law enforcement agency would be covered by the Vermont State Police. So we respond to those calls, we dispatch for ourselves and uh, we're, we would be essentially charging our own agency. Well, you could charge the town. I mean, you're charging Wilmington and we already pay for a police department and dispatch services. But we're dis the, the fees are for dispatching. They're not necessarily because of the incident. The fee is to cover the dispatching work that comes out of that. But there's dispatching work that comes out of every town. Correct, but the, the, through statute, we have to cover those towns. So when, when the Vermont State Police responds to those towns, the dispatchers are currently paid through the state of Vermont and those are covered through the, through the Vermont statute. We are, we are responding to those calls. With the, the work that comes from the local municipalities that do not have their own services, that is what is being uh, charged as the fee. So, you know, as a select board member for, for Wilmington, what I'm hearing you say is perhaps we should just get rid of our police department because we'll save a lot of money and have Vermont State Police do it. Is, I, I, but I just, I don't think that will be a, a good for my community. I, I, I mean- I, I agree with you. Um, and I, I, I can't say that uh, any town that wants to get rid of their police department is, uh, is, is not good for the community. Um, it, but, but then you're making a decision based on financial uh, respects alone. Um, if that might be financially feasible for your town, uh, but to put that pressure back on the Vermont State Police, I would say that the service that that town would get would be severely diminished. I would agree, but it seems your fee structure is pushing towns to at least consider that option. The, I mean, the, fee structure, the, fee, the fee structure is designed, as I said uh, in my opening statement, is designed for equality throughout the entire state. Um, okay, thank you. So I wanna ask a question just following on to what you just said. And I understand and respect the idea of trying to achieve equality across the state. Um, but I think that raising revenue on the property tax is not a very equitable um, landscape across the state. And I'm wondering if you considered just um, doing this through 
through your normal funding streams as opposed to putting it on the back of a local property tax payer who may or may not already be paying for local police services. Are you asking if we've looked at, I guess I don't understand it. Did we look at keeping operations the way we're, the way we're doing them right now? I'm just saying if we collectively decide as a state that it's important to provide uh, dispatch in a central way through the Vermont State Police, why would we not pay for that through general fund appropriation as opposed to putting it on the backs of local property taxpayers in this really unequitable mosaic of impact? Because for the very reason that we have right now is, is that we have certain communities that have um, and again, I'll use Lamoille just because I'm so familiar with it. They have a, a very trigonomic uh, filing fee to be charging, which was set by legislature out of a, uh, a lawsuit many years ago. Um, because there, there are other agencies out there that are already charging. We are not the only, excuse me, we are not the only agencies that are dispatching for everything. Uh, as I said, we have probably off the top of my head, 15 agencies out there that currently dispatch from multiple agencies and they have their own set of fees. Um, to set something statewide um, would set all the work to the Vermont State Police. I think. Bob Hooper has his hand up patiently. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm actually kind of asking maybe the same thing that you just asked, but it seems like this is an elaborate dance, which just essentially is a tax shift because you collect the money from the facility, the towns that want the service, it goes into this telecommunication fund. You're then authorized to use the telecommunication fund to support the activities of the department. And then you send in a budget request for running the department, which has to be diminished by the amount that you took in from other sources, doesn't seem like you're walking very far down the road here. It's there, you know, it's probably above your pay grade, but uh, it doesn't kind of make sense to me at this point. Well, I think the, 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 the design around here is, is also the, the, the amount of work that goes along with these dispatching uh, service is there. And if you look at the if you look at the average numbers, uh, if you have the fee structure there, sir, it, the, it costs the state of Vermont to run both dispatching. And I'm talking just the dispatchers. I'm not talking about overtime. I'm not talking just their basic salary. It, it costs the state of Vermont roughly $2,266,000. Um, the revenue that we will be generating uh, through these fees, just through their agencies, covers maybe a third of that. Um, it is not designed to uh, pay completely our, our overhead to, to run the center. It is designed to uh, assess a fee to those agencies that use our services for that period of time. Do we, I don't, I don't know this, maybe, uh... Alexa does, but as a town council person, when the snowplow drives down Route X that happens to go through Wilmington, do you get a charge back for plowing that road? Public public service sort of thing. I, I'm getting more and more puzzled by this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jim Harrison. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, uh, Captain, I apologize if I called you Lieutenant. I was confused on titles this morning. So um, I, I'm curious, you may not know the answer to this, but are this anticipation of dispatch fees built into your budget that we're about to probably pass um, this week for the last three quarters of the fiscal year? No, it is not. 
Okay, so this might be something you would consider for building next year's budget, but which hasn't been built yet. Correct, and this this uh, a fee. Um, this has been sent to the community saying that the commissioner intends to send this out in fiscal year twenty two. In a okay, in a tiered thank phase. you. When, Jim, when you, you say tiered, um, you mean, I think so, but what, what do we mean by tiered? So what we mean by tiered, we understand that for me to go to say Wilmington PD and say, hey, you now owe us a hundred and some odd thousand dollars, um, especially during these times is not, is not probably the, the it is not the, the, the best thing to do. So what the commissioner has proposed is that year one, we will collect 25% of the overall value. In year two, we will collect 50%, year three, uh, 75, and then after the final four year, we will collect the whole 100%. Okay. Thank you, sir. Marcia Gardner. We need to get you unmuted. Hmm. Good. Uh, we had you for a moment. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Thank you. Excellent. I am sorry for any technical issues I'm having. Um, for towns that have the state police as their primary source of uh, policing enforcement, and do not have their own police force, do they get charged a fee for, from uh, your department for uh, policing those towns? Do they pay anything? No, no. If they have a fire department and or an EMS, then yes, they will be charged a fee to them. It's so right. this, uh, I'm sorry. They're not for policing the, the town. Correct. They will not get a. They will not get assessed a fee for the policing. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from committee members? Great. Um, I we have um, in the room with us this morning Dan Dickerson from the Joint Fiscal Office, um, and I'm going to ask Dan to help us understand a bit more the complicated mosaic of, uh, of how we achieve dispatch across the state and its fiscal impacts. Hi, everyone. Uh, Dan Dickerson from Joint Fiscal. Um, I will say to you today that um, I'm coming into this discussion without a whole lot of background knowledge. Um, so, I think I can answer a few of your questions, um, or I can I can give some information, but I don't want to muddy the water, um, or I don't want to risk muddying the water. So I um, I don't want to say too much and then and then step on the toes of public safety. Um, you know, I'll just say that when when I was told about this bill. Um, I quickly sent off some questions to uh, Commissioner Sherling as far as, you know, is the department already charging some sort of dispatch fee? Um, and if, if so, you know, are they um, actually, let me, let me look at the questions specifically. Um, yeah, I asked if they were levying any sort of charge already. Um, and if not, does DPS have an estimate for the aggregate cost to provide the service? Um, I got an answer that the, the, they're not charging the fee currently, which I think you've already heard. And what they're looking, or what the costs are currently, it's about half of the operating costs of the PSAPs. And um, I did receive that in FY20, um, the cost of the P, operating PSAPs was 7.2 million. Um, 6.4 of that, was general fund and 850,000 was interdepartmental transfer, I think primarily um, from the universal service fund. 
And I've seen the, the spreadsheet um, that I think they've been working from as far as the, the four year phase in of the fees. Um, but, you know, one, one question that I have, and I don't know that it's been answered um, since I've been listening this morning um, is, you know, if, if they were to start charging these dispatch fees, are they looking to replace general fund or are they looking to add additional revenue? Um, and, and that's not clear to me at this point. Um, but, you know, as far as their calculations, I mean, I've, I've seen what they're doing. I guess, you know, st structurally, it, it makes sense. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to speak to, I guess, the, the policy decisions that they're making. Um, you know, I'll just speak to the numbers and, you know, it looks like their calculations are, I mean, you know, they look reasonable to me. Um, I guess that's all I'll say right off the bat and I'm happy to try to answer questions. Many members, any questions? All right, thank you, Dan. Um, uh, it's it's an interesting learning curve here, trying to understand the the complicated patchwork of uh, of dispatching around the state. So we appreciate you diving into this with us. Um, sure. Can, actually. Have, I do have one other little thing I just thought about that I'll add. I, I know somebody had raised the question of, um, you know, whether it's common for the General Assembly to delegate authority to um, raise fees. And there are some instances of that. It's, it's pretty rare, but um, a couple of examples I can think of are um, the Department of Forest Parks and Rec can um, raise state parks fees through rule. Um, and then there is bill back authority granted to, I believe, the Public Service Department and ANR. Um, and it's bill back authority for, um, I want to say, some projects that they, they review, uh, gosh, like solar projects and, and renewable energy projects. Um, if, they, if they spend time reviewing, then they have some authority to, to bill back. Um, which it sounds like this is somewhat comparable to that. Um, I mean, it sounds like what the department is looking to do is, is build back, but um, those are just a few instances that I thought of where uh, state agencies can levy, I guess, a fee or a charge without um, the General Assembly setting a charge, but that's all I have. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, I'm interested in the perspective of the League of Cities and Towns. I see that we have Gwen Zakoff with us today and um, would invite you to share your thoughts on this or other sections of the bill. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Hey, sorry. <laughs> Um, Gwyn Zakoff, for the record, um, Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, the League has no position on the dispatch uh, portion of the bill, so we really don't have much to add. I think a lot of the narrative has already been um, expressed from the prior, um, pre by prior testimony. Um, the reason we don't have a position is because we have half of our towns that sort of pay double and half that um, don't pay at all and some pay some more in between. So um, we have a lot of members who very, very feel very strongly about um, uh, the system not being equitable um, and not being fair. Um, and so, you know, therefore, you know, we can't really choose sides on this. We love all of our children um, equally. I think the most important part of this from the league's perspective in terms of dispatch is giving, um, having transparency in the fee structure and having um, there be time for communities to adjust their budgets to adapt. Um, I think that the three year, um, having three years in and having it be ramped up sort of in a tier structure sort of makes this the most sense if it were to go into place. Um, but beyond that, we don't really have much of a, 
um, a position um, other than the, the timing and, um, and transparency aspect of it. Great. Committee members, any questions for Gwen? All right. Um, I think I'd like to hear next from uh, from Drew Hazelton, um, the EMS uh, Advisory Committee um, Chair, and uh, and help us understand uh, not only um, the position on uh, dispatch, but any other thoughts or concerns you have with the bill. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. So uh, as far as the dispatch component that you've been discussing, um, you know, and we've heard a lot about the effect on law enforcement, but there is um, a significant financial effect on some of your local first response squads and uh, ambulance services. So as this uh, fee structure goes into effect, some of the people that will be um, assessed are um, nonprofit organizations that are raising all of their money through fundraising dollars. So our first response squads, those people in your towns that are getting to your houses first um, are volunteer and most of the time are fundraising uh, the majority of those dollars and are gonna be hit with uh, some pretty sizable fees can, uh, compared to their total annual operating budgets. Uh, some of the first response squads are you know, reporting 25 to 50% of what they use annually to keep their services running would be going to um, these dispatch fees. So just keep in mind as you have that discussion that there are, um, you know, first response squads that are going to, and ambulance services are going to be negatively affected by, um, by, by the dispatch uh, fee structure. Uh, as far as the, the rest of the kind of the EMS bill, the EMS advisory committee has been uh, looking at workforce development and uh, the challenges that are facing EMS uh, in great detail over the last couple of years in our um, quest to put out a thorough and accurate uh, report to the legislature and found some uh, concerning trends with our workforce and uh, turnover in our workforce, which is what started our uh, quest for additional education funds and building a more robust um, EMS education system, as well as creating a uh, a system where we can bring people into these first response squads uh, a little easier. So um, components of the bill, um, trying to remove administrative burden from small services. Uh, we, we talked about um, making licensing uh, easier for services. Uh, we looked at um, increasing the instructor coordinator um, positions, the, the people that are actually hosting and holding classes as a way to, um, to create a better education structure. So uh, we're glad to see that's in the bill. Uh, the Vermont responder was a, a, in response to our smallest uh, first response squads, creating a level that would get more first responders on the road. Um, so the licensing you know, language and cleanup language that are in the bill are uh, things that we were, were um, supportive of and and certainly worked with the Senate to get kind of the language right. So after reviewing what you guys have in this uh, version, um, I think the advisory committee is pretty pleased with, with what uh, what's in front of you. Great, thank you. Committee, any questions for Mr. Hazelton? All right. Um, next, I'd like to invite Patrick Malone to uh, to share thoughts on S124. Okay. Uh, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, comment on this bill and also uh, my apologies for not having a video link. Um, and what I wanted to comment on were uh, to kind of reinforce several of uh, the specific issues regarding EMS education that Chief Hazelton uh, just previously mentioned. Um, I'm the director of the Initiative for Rural Emergency Medical Services um, at the University of Vermont, and I'm a member of the State EMS Advisory Committee. 
Um, I think the one of the most uh, significant issues we're, we're addressing globally here is is some of the crisis uh, in EMS regarding personnel. And in my view, and I think the bill reflects this, uh, several of the solutions um, surround educational issues. So I, I'll list the four that I think this bill uh, will really, really address. And please keep in mind that this bill was developed before COVID-19 and the stresses on the system that, that it, it, it has caused. Um, the first one I think uh, that's in, important is to uh, formally structure the EMS Education Council. This bill and other sections address uh, law enforcement training and uh, fire service training. Um, up until now, um, to this proposal, EMS has not had um, a similar entity uh, to um, promote and support uh, education of EMS providers. So that is key, I think, for the other three points I'm gonna mention. Uh, the next is uh, EMS instructor levels. Our instructor levels were established back in the early 70s when uh, e the EMS system was formally established, actually the one instructor level. Um, EMS, like everything in the world, is increasingly sophisticated. Probably the most recent example from kind of a clinical standpoint would be learning more about uh, an emerging infection like COVID-19. Um, the other is dealing with changes in education and educational technology. Uh, let me tell you, I am, I've been in EMS education for 34 years and, and trying to do things online with Zoom and everything else is just about killing me. So um, I think it, this, uh, the idea of instructor levels would be to enhance the instructor, instructor or educational cadre by providing additional training and experience and recognizing uh, individuals as they gain that experience with higher levels of responsibility. So the establishing the instructor levels uh, is, is critical. The next is um, the, the section that addresses the alternative to psychomotor skills testing. Um, the issue there is uh, the logistical and administrative burden that um, evaluating people uh, in a subjective way on their psychomotor skills, uh, the, the effects it has um, on all aspects of the educational system. Uh, many other states have alternatives to this, and this particular language uh, coming up with a a method of it being evaluated during the program by the licensed course instructor um, would help help solve that. It also would put EMS in line with, with other professions uh, where the evaluation of skills are important. For instance, athletic trainers and nurses here at the University of Vermont have their skills evaluated during their course of study. Um, at the completion of their course and study, of their course of study is where they sit for their written a certification or licensure exam. So it would put it in line with that. Um, finally, uh, and uh, Chief, Chief uh, Hazelton mentioned this specifically, um, an entry level certification uh, for emerging medical services in Vermont, which um, it, it, in my view of this, it would be specific to Vermont only. Uh, it, I, it doesn't mean to um, anyhow uh, subvert or change the National Registry of EMTs, which is uh, kind of the national, more or less the national standard, and, and one that I believe is fundamentally sound. But it would uh, give us a chance to take advantage of other training programs that individuals in Vermont participate in. Uh, and probably the most obvious of those are the, the folks that work on ski patrols and have their certification through the National Ski Patrol Association. Um, other things like wilderness first responder, other training programs that we use in, in lots of aspects of life in Vermont to kind of you know, pick and develop a program from those things to have a simple entry level for, a, especially for a community member that has limited time for training and education. And maybe they just, uh, they're, they're seeing if this is a compatible endeavor for them. Uh, that's all the comments I have. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. 
Thank you for helping us put that in context. Um, committee members, any questions for Patrick Malone? All right. Um, any any words that folks didn't get in at the time we were on a topic that they want to come back to? Because we have just a few minutes left here in our committee discussion today. Um, and I wanted to invite anyone else who had a last question or statement to share that with us. All right, in the interest of using this time well, I would like to open this up to a little bit of committee discussion. Um, I, I think we spent a fair amount of our time this morning talking about the dispatch sections of the bill. Um, and I wonder if we um, could open that up for committee discussion about how we move forward in a way that seems, um, seems fair and equitable to our communities. Jim Harrison. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Last week, we heard um, that there were some interest. In. Can you hear me? Uh, we can okay. now. OK, sorry. Um, is this an issue that ways and means should look at and amend, or should we do this section on the dispatch fees? Um, I suspect if we don't, they will. Um, but if we want to accomplish this in a way that achieves a policy objective, such as um, predictability, fairness, equity, um, then this is uh, certainly a good discussion to have in the policy committee. Okay, thank you. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, I, I guess one of my concerns about the dispatch fees is even though they had heard concerns before, they still put out a spreadsheet which had inaccuracies in it. And, you know, my concern is even if they do what they say, which is reach out to towns and, and, and try to fix some of those problems, um, there may be other towns that, that don't have it. I, I wish there was a more collaborative approach um, of setting these fees and figuring out this problem without the Vermont State Police dictating um, what apparently the fees will be for each town um, and fire department and rescue squad. Um, and I do think that the General Assembly should have some input into this process. I mean, just to make sure that towns and communities are being charged um, accurate fees. And I really do also worry about the fees being charged rescue. I mean, they can't just go to tax <coughs> necessarily and increase the property tax. Um, so they're gonna have to eat this in their budget somehow. Um, and we already know that rescue squads across the state are, are struggling as it is. So, I mean, I just have a lot of concerns about this and, and worry um, about moving too quickly um, to setting fees for FY22. Thanks, John. Mike Merwicki. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to <clears throat> follow with the thread that Representative Gannon just shared with some concerns about uh, increasing the, the pressures on, on rescue squads. Uh, I'm not aware of across the state how they're doing, except from what we hear from Drew Hazelton, who heads rescue in, in Wyndham County. And it, I know the challenges are, are, are formidable and, and we have talked with Drew <clears throat> since the start of COVID over various ways we could help just to help them keep the doors open. And I'm concerned that if we're gonna add pressure onto that, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it, there's not gonna be good outcomes there. So I'd like us to take a, a little bit different look at that. Thanks, 
Thanks, Mike. Uh, Dan Batsy, did you have something you wanted to share on that? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to add and, and, and concur with the testimony that was just delivered and uh, with Representative Moicki as well. The, the, the challenge of rescue is that we have no means to generate tax revenue. Uh, most agencies bill on a fixed structure. Uh, they're paid a fixed uh, uh, revenue from Medicare and Medicaid uh, and anything else uh, is, is really not returned. So they have no flexibility. They have no challenge. They have no capability to go out there and say, we're going to uh, raise more taxes. Uh, there are some agencies, of course, that have that relationship with the town, but uh, by and large across the state, uh, most of the agencies that, that, you, that we see are dealing with simple insurance revenues and those are fixed. So this is a, a big challenge. And, and uh, as Drew Hazelton mentioned a moment ago, uh, it's in a time when these agencies are in a very precarious place. Can appreciate that. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, I have to say, I, I agree that this is absolutely an issue that we need to take a look at. I'm concerned that the timeline may be a little quick, although some people would feel that we're trying to kick the can down the road here. Along with volunteer EMS, we get volunteer fire departments as well that um, most communities have. And, you know, having been a member of one of those for many years out there doing um, boot drops just to raise the, the revenues that you need. But now also representing a community, I mean, Barrytown, our dispatch costs are, I think, somewhere north of $232,000 a year. Um, I recognize we're probably a, a large user of that, but there really is a fairness and an equity issue to this that I think we really need to, to, to take a look at. Um, I would certainly be in favor of us looking at something maybe a little broader because um, there are communities that don't have EMS or law enforcement, but still get coverage, whether it be through state police or some other entity that, um, if I understand this formula correctly, may not end up uh, being required to contribute. So I would certainly um, support a, a little broader look at this, not strictly just from VSP, but also um, recognizing that we need to, at least next session, I suspect, weigh into this more. Thanks, Rob. Any other comments from committee members? Go ahead, Hal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I like the idea that Representative Harrison uh, proposed about, you know, how do we look at ourselves as a, as a large city, as a state, and we 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 come up with a 21st century um, funding process and and center, so we have the efficiency should have with with one center. Um, I think that's something to seriously look into. Uh, as we move forward. Great. All right, any other questions, comments from committee members? All right, I wanna thank all of you for joining us this morning. Um, and uh, I believe you will wanna take a peek at the committee page. There are a few um, folks who have submitted written testimony, not necessarily on these sections of the bill, um, but on others. Um, take, a, take a peek at those uh, in the little bit of bonus time that you have right now, hardworking committee members. Um, and we will be back in committee tomorrow morning at 8.30. Um, so do feel free to reach out to me if you need me between now and tomorrow morning. Uh, Mike Merwicki. Uh, Madam Chair, just to give the committee a little uh, update on what Representative Colston and I have been doing to try and usher the um, <clears throat> the OPR bill. Uh, we, we did meet with Ways and Means this morning and, and they approved the, the, the bill that we, we brought to them uh, 
eleven zero. Uh, after this committee, I think at two p.m. we're going to appropriations. So hopefully we can keep this moving and uh, and get it back to our committee so we can send it to the floor. I don't know if Hal wants to add something to that, but we we worked hard this morning. <laughs> Lots of moral support for sure. <laughs> Great work. Thank you, committee, for uh, for your great work on that. Um, and uh, hopefully we can get that shepherded to the floor pretty quickly. Jim Harrison. Yeah, just as a FYI, um, the Senate concurred with S-233 as we sent it back to them. So that bill should be on the way to the governor. Excellent. Good news. All right, if there's nothing else, committee, have a wonderful rest of your day. And um, uh, Hal and Mike, good luck in appropriations this afternoon.